everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are getting into the Milan Fashion Week reviews. Now we're gonna be talking about six different brands, the Italian staples and a couple little um, dark horses in the Italian fashion family that honestly I was not expecting to discuss. But listen, like they came, they showed, they made a statement. So without further ado, let's get into our Milan Fashion Week reviews for the fall 2021 season. First up is Roberto Cavalli. Now Roberto Cavalli stopped designing for his eponymous label back in 2014. And since then it's lost the one sexy sparkle that made it a shining star in Italian fashion. But the brand is back in this time led by Fausto Puizzi, who runs his own brand and was formerly at Ungaro. Cavalli once famously said, quote, God is the greatest designer referring to his love of nature-based motifs, and well, Puyizi is trying to channel the brand's energy just in that same way. The collection started with an asymmetrical dress, full of leopard and zebra prints. It's not a great start, but there is an explanation for it. The Cavalli brand's biggest market is the American one, and Fausto has ties to the US and its culture as well, so he recreated the American flag, which he describes as, quote, pop art, in its own new, funky, fresh way, just with Cavalli Cavalli-esque motifs. Unfortunately, the fit of this dress feels more like a draped bedsheet than an actual constructed garment, and unfortunately, I think Betsy Ross would be disappointed. In the next image, you can find the United States of Cavalli flag hanging on the wall and a slew of looks underneath. We can discuss the styles as they come up. A turtleneck is paired with a ball gown skirt in a tiger print, and from here we can see that animals will most definitely remain as inspiration for Puyizi. And the fact that tiger colors have been muted is interesting, but not revolutionary. To cut Puyizi some slack, he did describe this collection not as his first collection, but as collection zero, which might mean that this is more of a pre-collection than, you know, a debut. Roberto Cavalli shocked fashion in the early 1970s when his crazy colored leathers made their debut, but there weren't crazy colored leathers here. Rather, classic black leathers adorned with gold animal teeth adornments. I don't know if it will attract customers, but I do think it's a smart nod to the brand's history without being reductive. The tiger-faced bag does have a Ricardo Tichy Givenchy reminiscence, but Puizzi will have to work a lot harder to innovate on accessories, as it's a major driving factor financially for many brands. Gaudy, tacky, and gauche are just a few words that could describe Cavalli, but the brand can usually sex it up so much that these descriptors don't hold much weight. Unfortunately, these full of embellishment and motif dresses are not able to avoid the aforementioned descriptors. While I'm sure there is a customer for this sort of style, I think Puyuzi should make these styles a lot smoother, otherwise it feels like a conceptual upchuck. Denim is another signature of Cavalli. Here, this seems like a very smart reference to the the brand's popularization of sandblasting styles, which came around in the early 90s. For the record, Cavalli no longer sandblasts their denim, but this sand-colored look feels like it's a bleach treatment of sorts, but this does seem to nod to that style that the brand so heavily inspired. Puyizi also said that his Cavalli doesn't want to clout chase. Rather, he wants it to stay loyal to its roots, and instead of making streetwear, he'd rather innovate on the brand's already established key segments. I will say it's nice that there is no in-your-face logo on the shirt's chest, but I'd stitch pick my flag off. Puyizi then mixes 1950s silhouettes with 1980s shoulder pads, which isn't that bad, but you need to find a customer for it. Puyizi took no time in debuting lots of gowns. One assumes he will be hearkening back to the red carpet glory days of Cavalli, but his collage styles of black, tiger, and leopard need to up the ante, not just remind us of any old thing off the rack. What looks like a cow print cable knit sweater with sharp angular 80 shoulders is great, except for the American flag plastered on the front. The look minus the flag is actually really nice overall and adds a new animal print into the mix, but a dash of editing would do Puyizi a lot of good. While I understand Cavalli's want to look to its history involved with celebrity and Hollywood culture, these Cavalli-esque merch shirts with a Cavalli Walk of Fame star is really more of a walk of shame. 
I know that there is a market for clueless rich people with no taste that buy luxury good t-shirts, but I would hope that the Cavalli team understands that even they deserve some respect. Tiger face motifs make their way into cocktail dresses and backless gowns. I won't say they are particularly tasteful, but the Cavalli customer loves the over the top and in your face styles and I could see these selling easily. I do think the heels that look like the curved fangs of a ferocious feline are very smart and could be a smart way for the brand to boldly break into the foot wear category. More collage styles emerge in a gown here, with tigers layered on top of each other, which meets leopard prints and an embroidered bust. This collage style is central to Pugizi's work, but I wonder if the Cavalli customer will bite. Now, my real gripe with this collection overall is showcased in a tiger printed gown with a high slit and feather piping. The collection is too on the nose. Cavalli was a rebel. He was salacious and caused scandal. Puyizi in this look, which seems like a direct reference to an iconic red carpet look worn by Aaliyah, pointed out by Fendi Faget on Twitter, needed to innovate on the style, but here it didn't. Instead, it is not nearly as exciting and looks like a dress off of Sheen, Romway, or Fashion Nova. This is a house of innovation. It should never ever look like this. Cutout dresses in black do seem on trend now, and a double slit dress is to die for. The way the dress ombres from black to leopard is smart and fun and exciting, but these should be the safe Cavalli styles. Cavalli needs to go back to its roots of shocking and for the right reasons, not the wrong ones. And I know that Puyizi could do that, it's just, I need to see it happen. A full tiger print look with trench coat, pant, and boot is hot. If Puyizi can manage to court the customers that believe animal prints are a neutral, I think he will be able to truly rehab the brand. A black and leopard ombre dress with a high slit is paired with a pair of leopard and ombre pants underneath. And I do think it works. It channels that sexiness that Cavalli is known for without having to display skin. Simpler cut dresses in black and tiger face prints emerge, and while they're not groundbreaking, these nice cuts with that sexy edge will probably Probably help merchandisers feel comfortable with stocking the brand. A pannier skirt is paired with an enlarged tiger face top and tiger face leggings. I enjoy the Rococo reference, but would really love a full Marie Antoinette in an animal print experience. Give me a double box plate at the back. That's when I'm gonna be about it. A simple black dress has the double slits and the little gold teeth appliques are dotting the neckline. A black pleated dress has Greco-Roman antiquity influences and seems to harken back to Puyizi's love of his home country of Italy. Italy. A suit full of embroidery seems to be a take on recreational leopard print, but it falls very flat as it's indiscernible to the point where I'm actually unsure if it's actually trying to recreate leopard print still. A puffer in tiger print is interesting, while caftans in the same print also piqued my interest, and the finale in leopard was sweet, but no showstopper. To be honest, Cavalli needs a lot of work. Roberto needs to electrocute the brand with ingenuity, and the first showing hasn't done that. Luckily, this is collection zero, and I actually believe that Cavalli and Fausto Puizzi are a great match, but I need a lot more. A lot, lot more. Molto, molto, molto. No bene. Next, let's talk about Fendi. Now, Kim Jones debuted his first ready to wear collection for Fendi, and I have changed my mind since my Instagram story review. Listen, I still think overall there wasn't much emotion, and that is a problem, but at the same time, Kim never really shows emotion in his clothing, so maybe that's just how he operates. But upon really looking at this collection, it's evident Jones isn't trying to revamp Fendi into this revolutionary fashion house that will go down in history for amazing pieces we've never seen before. Instead, Kim, it seems, is trying to make this brand a financial juggernaut, in the same way Louis Vuitton and Dior are. Kim Jones might have studied at Central St. Martin's, but he really went to school at the University of Bernard are no. And you know what? I can say it. I was a little bit too harsh when talking about the collection on Instagram. Kimmy, apologies. So let's get into it. The collection started off with a brown reverse shearling coat, a nod to the fact that Fendi was started as a fur house in 1925. Really, truly, not a bad look and most likely will sell, but is this how we want to start off the vision for the brands ready to wear? My main gripe throughout this collection, as you will see, is not with the clothing per se, but Kim's lack of will to elevate the clothing to tell a story or create a sense of, well, anything. The next look gave us what I expected of Kim. 
tailoring, as it is a field he is much more comfortable in. A camel coat in what looks like a wool is interesting, as the way it's been woven to mimic some sort of dense hair. In reality, it pays homage to fur and animal hairs, which I think is smart, but also an obvious choice at Fendi. The Karlligraphy Fendi logo, which Karl Lagerfeld first introduced in 1981, was seen on a pair of tights, a bag, and shorts. The boy shorts almost have an Edwardian schoolboy feel, and again play to Kim's strong suit of tailoring. The scarf with fringe at the bottom is interesting, but I'll discuss that more later. A simple off-the-shoulder dress follows in camel, which shows Kim stepping more and more into dressmaking. It's a nice dress and will most likely sell to the Fendi customers, but is it something I could deep dive into for its cultured and nuanced perspective? No. A fur top is bodacious and falls down the front and creates fringe as it covers a skirt. This is where Jones's Fendi doesn't stay just solely commercial. I think it's smart to play up fur. Mind you, it's not radical, but at least it's fun. And from the front, the idea that one might assume you were wearing a full fur coat with fringe is quite amusing. A boucle style blazer and bag are paired with a rib knit crop top and shin length skirt. Commerciality at its finest. I will say Kim most likely will not only court older, more conservative customers with this collection, but younger, more showy customers too. A fur jacket looks intricately made and creates a herringbone motif and falls down the front like previous styles. But the fringe that falls to the front is different to the other styles and is eerily similar to Bottega Veneta fall 2020 collection for fringe coats. I mean, Bottega has committed worse copying offenses in my opinion, so I'm not trying to martyrize Daniel Lee's Bottega Veneta, but anyone that tells you these two things are different, well, they're probably on the Fendi payroll. And to be honest, I actually think the look is great overall. My complaints about Kim's couture collection seems to be remedied in looks like these, as they're not only exciting, but a good use of the atelier's time too. A light brown fur, I'm not an expert in animal skin, so please excuse my not knowing if it's fox, mink, sable, or any other small fluffy creature, is trimmed with some type of python motif, seeing as how Fendi dabbles in fur, I wouldn't be shocked to see it be real python. While many despise these uses of animal skins, it does harken back to the heyday of exotic animal skins and the brand's history of serving an upper crust clientele. The asymmetrical shirt dress is concerning. I understand it plays to Kim's notions of menswear, which I can respect, but it does need to be workshopped. The asymmetry is off kilter and intended to be that way, of course, but doesn't create a style worth the effort. High-waisted corduroys, again, nod to tailoring, and if it works with customers, more power to Kim. But they're not that exciting. And neither is the cropped up sweater it's paired with, but that could be a hit with young Fendi customers, which does show Kim's range. If Kim is courting customers of all age categories, I think he's able to blend styles that would entice both groups decently enough. And if he can get older customers to feel young again and get younger customers to also feel somewhat mature, he's cross-pollinated his collection to gross even more revenue. And listen, that's what it's about with these people. I've been pretty positive thus far, but the asymmetrical gathered silk dress should never see the light of day. Kim obviously needs more time to develop his draping, but well, maybe maybe he can just leave the draping be, cause well, it's hurting my eyes. Another fringe jacket appears, and this one particularly looks like the Bottega coats from the previous season we mentioned. They're not identical, as this is a jacket with elongated front, but they're definitely similar, and seeing how much press that Bottega coat got, I could see it making its way onto a mood board or two. But that doesn't mean that this coat isn't nice, cause it's actually lovely, and hopefully in future collections, the elongated front could be placed in the back to create a new take on coattails. Listen, Kim playing to his strengths is not something that I'm gonna be super upset about. A silky white slip dress has an added halter detail that falls down the front and creates a temporary A-line shape through its excess panels. If it sells, I shan't be mad about it, but I think it's gonna be a hard thing to sell merchandisers on. A silk set mixes Jones's tailoring abilities with more feminine sensibilities, and this is where his Fendi shines. The button-down skirt that is cropped has long, dramatic sleeves and creates a fabric flower at the center, and to me, that's Kim staying in his territory smartly while also giving it a more flowy flair. The fabric flower seems to be Kim's calling card at Fendi, and if it works, I can't say shit. The pants are a bit baggy in my opinion, but this high-waisted pant and crop top style no doubt can speak to a younger crowd, but can probably also be adopted for a more conservative customer too. A mohair rib knit in a light, light, light matte pink is actually kind of nice. The showstopper piece from this collection is a bodacious and decadent floor-length coat. 
Jones's fur use was quite restrained. There was not this opulence and excess on display just about everywhere in this collection except for this look. It's a large brown sugar colored coat that looks like it's just seen the Backstreet Boys with frosted tips and said, I want that. From the neck down to the hips, it's just a big fur coat. But when it gets to the thighs, it begins to become a waterfall of thick fringe. This could be a reference to the use of animal tails in fur coat decorations, and by proxy, a style of fringe. In reality, it does give a different movement to the textile and helps to add even more grandeur to an already grand coat. If Kim wants to honor the legacy of Karl Lagerfeld's Fendi, I hope he places more pieces like these throughout his collections, as Fendi is all about fur innovation. A pink silky set channels the high-low style we saw earlier, but it's definitely a bit different. The button down was cut tight to the torso, and long sleeves were held together by Fendi logo charms. A high-waisted pant was paired with it too, and for those not looking for the fabric flowers, this might be the viable option. The Carligraphy, aka Carl Lagerfeld's calligraphy version of the Fendi double F logo was placed on a double layered slip dress. The asymmetry of the Carligraphy is strange and I'm not sure how the customers will react to it or if it will sell. The Carligraphy was reportedly made in 1981, as we already mentioned, and has been around for a while. So it might do well with customers, but it's nowhere near as popular as the classic Fendi Fendi double F logo. A brown suede and leather jacket is nice as the suede allows the perforated leather with carligraphy double Fs to subtly make their way into the garment. It's not revolutionary, but definitely fashionable enough to surpass being solely commercial. A brown silky slip is full of beads, but it's really no different than any other slip with beads that we've seen. So it becomes easily forgettable. But again, I think Kim's whole thing is like, make the money to spend the money. So. I feel like that's what he's going for. A sheer turtleneck cocktail dress is piped with silky brown fringe at the hem that is most definitely full. While Kim no doubt caters to the more conservative crowd, he's evidently not afraid to show off some skin. It's a cute look and probably more of a showpiece, which makes me want even more from styles like this. A brown dress is interestingly constructed as it has blunt but sharp shoulders and a baggy bust, but at the waist becomes clingy. It's incredibly simple, but the proportions seem strange and paired with a knee-high boot, it doesn't particularly help it either. Either. A brown cocktail dress is covered by a large brown shawl coat that has the thin brown fur fringes. And again, you can't not see Bottega here, but once you look past that, it's a nice coat. Another silky dress with halter panel details flows in a muddy pink. It's not great especially when you see the buttons fall down the front and when you see the snakeskin belt over it, I have Maria Grazia flashbacks. Dior has rubbed off a little bit too much on Kim. A muted green corduroy jacket has some of the biggest lapels I've ever seen. The tailoring is done well here as the lapels become the real detail of the look as they expose the pieces underneath, but the belt is again, unsettling. I understand that it keeps the lapels in place, but with Kim's tailoring being so strong, I hope he can develop the style to keep its same shape without requiring a belt. A strapless, asymmetrically gathered cocktail dress is hideous. No way around it. I understand Kim is trying to make pieces that appease more youthful customers, but looks like these are more Fendi Nova. A sheer cocktail dress exposes a bra and bottoms underneath it, which might make it more of a showpiece for the brand, but the lush, silky fringe piping seems to be a more realistic style that could be a adapted for customers. But listen, I'm not a prude and the look is interesting to me. A greenish leather jumpsuit looks really nice and has perforated details on the pockets and collar and is covered by a greenish brown fur coat. Only one side of the coat has the Bottega-ish fringe and I can't understand customers wanting only half a gangly fur coat but that's just me. A brown knit crop top and skirt will no doubt be a commercial juggernaut. And the Fendi fur branded bag will most likely be an attempt from Jones to create an accessory that will sell. The true money makers of luxury conglomerates like LVMH, which owns Fendi, is its accessories, usually bags. So for Kim, his main job will be providing pieces that will be as commercially successful as Fendi's famous baguette bag. I don't know if this bag will be it, but uh, we'll see. The idea of marble is very much a part of Fendi with Silvia Venturini Fendi referring to the famed Italian Carrera marble in past collections. Her fall 2019 haute couture collection secured love for most critics and showcased her ability to play into the family's tradition of fun fur. Jones created his own marble motifs in a silky crop top button down style and it's paired with high waisted green suede pants. Over top is a gray python print trench coat, which seems like Jones is trying to showcase how his customers can wear their Fendi separates. I don't know if these pieces will sell for sure, but I can for sure say that the motifs Jones is bringing out should be explored in fur styles. A crochet bra top is paired with, of course, high waisted corduroy pants and neither is too appealing, but the shearling coat is nice and will certainly get 
get shearling lovers going. I have no idea who that would be. A cream matching set has the perforated techniques we have seen quite a lot throughout the collection. And while it's quite blah, it's very clean and smart and chic, so I can't be mad about it. A black knit crop top set is something we've seen time and time again, but the Fendi calligraphy in printed shearling coat was new. Emblazoning a fur coat with a logo is quite Fendi-ish and might delight showy customers. A navy blue wool coat is nice, nothing revolutionary, but could prove popular with Fendi clients that are over the use of the brand's most famous textile. The fringe at the bottom isn't fur, but rather navy blue rope styles, which is a fun take on the fringe and would have been nice to see earlier in the collection, Kim. Now Kim debuted his take on fabric flowers for Fendi first during the Fendi Spring 2021 Haute Couture collection. It wasn't pretty. But the technique makes an appearance once again as the attachment points for a black cape over a cocktail dress. To be honest, one of them looks like an asshole to me, and that's not really meant to be mean. I just genuinely look at it and seal a booty hole. I just can't get it out of my head. A long black lapel dress is lovely. It incorporates classic tailoring elements while still feeling sleek and chic. While I don't know if the House of Fendi is seeped in traditional tailoring elements, pieces like these seem like a mainstay for Kim's women's wear work from here on out. And if customers like these different takes on feminine and masculinized styles, I think ready to wear wise, Fendi might be able to compete with Dior, at least financially. A suit jacket with long lapels is tucked into a pair of high-waisted pants with what looks like a cummerbund joining the two pieces. Oftentimes, designers cut a suit with a woman's body in mind and call it a day, but Kim doesn't seem to be settling in that regard. The suit feels new and sleek while still being respectable and professional. I'm a bit tired of designers expecting to hang onto the coattails of Yves Saint Laurent's Le Smoking Suit and getting all of the praise. If there's any designer working right now who could revolutionize feminine tailoring, Kim Jones would be a front runner. That's the truth. The finale look should have been swapped with the one we just saw. This long lapel jacket is nice and might be a commercial smash like many other pieces in this collection, but it's definitely not a finale worthy look. To be honest, I was a bit quick with my early review of Kim Jones's first Fendi ready to wear collection. While I stand by some of what I said, I was a bit rash in terms of judging this collection. And I think this collection is a lot more about putting Fendi's ready to wear on a steady financial footing rather than trying to create a spectacle for the masses. And while a part of me, of course, loves fashion, this collection needs to be contextualized as more product. And while there was a lot of kinks that need to be on ironed out, there was a lot that most definitely will be desired by Fendi customers of young and old, as well as Dior men's customers who were looking for women's wear from Kim Jones. Honestly, I'm kind of excited to see what happens next ready to wear season. Next up, let's talk about Prada. Mutra Prada and Raph Simmons' Dance of Titans continues, and while I'm not sure what kind of ballroom dance they're doing, I think it's interesting to see that while during menswear, Raph leads, in women's wear, it's evidently still Mucha's stomping ground. It's really easy to look at this collection and say it's really no different from the fall 2021 menswear collection. That was shown earlier this year, but that would be naive to say the least. The collection starts off with two takes on skirt suits that do create a large fringe style of its own. Mucha has combined her kick pleat skirts, which she is famed for, and her love of fringe, which can be found in her early 90s collections too. And so here, there is this little reinvention of the skirt suit. A button down shirt is layered underneath both, and graphic turtlenecks give them that wacky Prada feel, and a pair of graphic tights that cover the legs and shoes only furthers that. A form-fitting black dress is piped with knit graphics, a Raph Simmons style that we saw heavily during his Calvin Klein tenure. Underneath is a purple graphic turtleneck, which seems to be a new constant for the brand since Raph joined the creative team. When you look up close, you can see the graphic from the turtleneck slightly mirrored on the black dress, which might mean that there's a very subtle print, but I personally think that the dress is just sheer. Either could be possible, but sheerness is a very common Mucha Prada trope that has come again and again on the runway. I will say Prada, like most other brands, needs to focus on accessories because that puts them in the same heavyweight championship with LVMH and Kering. And unfortunately, these leather shoes might not be the commercial smash they hope for. In reality, it's a real disappointment to see them almost exclusively throughout the collection as this is the best time to unleash a host of creative styles and see what buyers and customers choose while the iron is hot. The next look confirms that the look is actually sheer, which as we've mentioned is Prada-esque and something about the sheer black dress paired with this heavy knit piping and sleeves plays to Mucha's work in dichotomies. The Prada gloves during the menswear collection were a real smash, and it's smart that Prada has adapted them for the women's wear collections too, this time in an icy blue and a bunch of other colors, so, you know, 
have your pick. I'm not sure if the knit floral motif bag will be commercially viable though. Suits then arrive and are very menswear inspired and don't seem to be cut with a woman's physique in mind, which might be attractive to certain customers. The layering of the graphic knits underneath definitely references Raph, but has a more Prada context to the graphic knits, which might actually help the style cozy up to clients and the audience. A black faux fur coat seems to reference the Rem Koolhaas design set for the collection and does have a Prada triangle plate at the back of the neck, which has become a Raph Simmons signature at Prada. Raph has really tried to incorporate the triangle into the collections often, as it's a strong branding tool that should be used more and more by the company as it references its Italian heritage. Mucha doesn't like to reference the brand's heritage too, too much, but like Margiela, who inspired Raph Simmons to change from an industrial design student to a fashion designer, he wants to center this area, and I actually think it's very smart. Coats with rounded shoulders and short bulbous sleeves came next, although they differed in fabrication. The first was a navy blue wool-like coat, which for customers looking for long-lasting, not trendy pieces, will be in luck. The second was a bright yellow jacket that is filled with lines, which writer Madeline Holth mentioned was actually called Flox Corduroy, which is a Raph Simmons developed textile. Online, the color palette of the fabric is described as, quote, 1970s yet with a contemporary twist, which might explain quite a lot about Raph's creative input for the brand. Mucha's geometric prints were made popular during the spring 1996 Ugly Chic collection and for decades has always been referenced by Milan's fashion dom. It's also smart for Raph to incorporate his own textiles into Prada, as it melds his aesthetic into the brand not just design-wise, but through the very basic blueprint of the garment. A black dress is piped in a green knit and might attract less outlandish customers, but it'll be interesting to see if these knits, which were a mainstay at Calvin Klein 205 West 39 NYC, will sell. Calvin Klein 205 West 39 NYC financially didn't deliver in the way PVH, the brand's parent company, wanted, and so this will be Raph's challenge at Prada, turning his well-known aesthetic into something that is profitable for a major conglomerate. Another faux fur coat is in a more natural color, which might sell well. And then three coats emerge and are very similar to styles that we saw during the menswear collections of the same season. Knit collars flow out from underneath the coats to make the knitwear aspect well known, while a triangular cutout at the neckline definitely pays homage to the brand's heritage and the Prada brand pre Mucha. While the Prada Triangle logo is most definitely famous, I'm not sure it competes at the level of Louis Vuitton or Gucci monograms, which might be something that Simmons is trying to change by consciously and unconsciously placing it in front of his audience over and over again. The buttons on the coat are a reference back to Mucha's second collection, and the use of the triangles on the buttons were something she despised and never used again until Raph came. Now, it seems that Mucha, with the help of Raph, is trying to work through her dislike of the constant use of the Prada logo in the same way she worked through her dislike of lace during her infamous fall 2008 collection. So listen, I respect that hustle. Another graphic knit appears, this time in a cardigan style, and it's paired with a colorful polo shirt and logo button skirt which seems to be the duo's attempt to showcase what separates combined might look like for the everyday Prada customer. I personally would like to study the Prada customer. They must be oh so fascinating. Another knit cardigan is paired with a button skirt. And well, a faux fur and knit stole, the likes of which is reminiscent of early Prada collections and Raph's odes to Mucha during his tenure at Jill Sander as well. We saw bomber jackets during Raph and Mucha's menswear debut, and while many attributed the styles to Raph, Mucha's influence is not far behind. The inner layer of knitting definitely references the knits we've discussed ad nauseum by now, but the bomber jackets reference Raph Simmons' fall 2001 Riot 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 collection, where his legendary bomber jackets still garner five-figure prices. But Mucha has referenced military styles as well and has done it in her signature Pocono Nylon, which is reflected in these nylon bombers in black and brown. And if you think about it, the original Pocono Nylon bags that came out were in what color? colors, black and brown. The sleeves of both jackets also have triangular pockets, which make the jackets even more utilitarian, but also in the Prada triangle once again. Probably the most absurd pieces from the collection came next, but it's Prada, so absurdity is pretty much rewarded. Stoles are made of faux fur on the outside, but bright shiny paillettes cover the inside, which are both Prada styles Mucha has explored in the past. The faux fur that we've seen so much of dates back throughout the decades from the early 1990s to as recent as fall 2017. 
and the stoles actually date back to Mucha's late 1980s collection, with styles like this being seen on the likes of Linda Evangelista. Mind you, these styles are a lot more maximal than the early days, but Mucha's never-ending quest to modernize embroideries is continued on in these paillettes. Prada is also a brand of intelligence and indulgence, and something about having paillettes only be visible and felt by the wearer just makes a lot of sense somehow. And while the stoles of earlier were certainly a lot, minimal jackets that must be held together by the wearer reference the iconic Prada Pocono nylon while also having ties to Mucha's early styling and Raph's love of that styling too. The pieces are quite dramatic, but at the same time, seeing as how they are monochromatic, have a minimal feel to them too. And more nylon stole jackets emerge, but here they are lined with faux fur, which does create quite a decadent feeling. I truly think all of these stole styles are the standout Prada pieces of the season. They are heavily referential of Mucha's past work, which is probably the most Prada-esque thing that Prada does. But at the same time, the cuts of these nylon and fur stoles do create a newness, a fearlessness, and an occupancy of the hands that defies Prada's notions of the intelligent woman. But maybe this woman is so intelligent that she actually knows that her presence scares just about anybody into doing just about anything she wants. And like, you know, if you scare everybody, you don't have to carry a bag, you only have to carry your coat. Raph Simmons's Phlox Corduroy makes more appearances in coats of green and blue, which are vibrant and do nod to Raph's other projects like his work with the Danish textile firm Kvadrat. I would love to get some swatches of the textiles as it seems they're quite plush, but I think coats like these might be more commercially viable for the brand. Not only are they nicely cut coats, but their colors seem to be the sweet spot for the Prada customers who often want something that they can wear forever, but has a quirk that makes it stand out as well. The yellow boucle coat is sweet not too complicated, and also might be a merchandising-minded style that keeps the weirdness of Prada alive. Jumpsuits that have deep plunging v-necks are strange. Again, I can see an attempt to make clothing that will sell, but I'm just concerned customers will not bite. But on these gloves, well, I think they will easily sell out. I will be online to buy them. Some graphic turtleneck jumpsuits arrive, and well, they're weird, but they're also that 1960s and 1970s motif styles that Mucha loves, which might make them more show pieces than anything else. The finale looks are paillette coats, which might seem frivolous to some, but well, then I remember how beloved the Prada plastic fringe styles are, and I lose all sense of doubt immediately. I do wish a more exciting style could have finished off the collection though. To be honest, I don't think this was a bad Prada collection. Prada is always going to be weird, Prada is always going to be wild, and Prada seems like like it is trying to evolve, which I have to give it some credit for. I do think Raph and Mucha as a duo are stronger on the menswear side, but I think this was a great collection that showcased they are definitely becoming more and more in sync as their collaborative efforts continue. Next up, let's talk about Blue Marine. Blue Marine is a brand I have actually never discussed before. To be honest, I had to do some research before even doing this review because I know so little about the brand, but so many people were drawn to this fall 2021 collection, I couldn't not discuss discuss it. Now, Nicola Brognano is the current creative director and is quickly becoming one of fashion's himbos. But just because he might be considered pretty doesn't mean his early 2000s collection is something to scoff at. I can't believe I'm calling people himbos in fashion reviews. The collection starts with a silky lace piped crop top and is paired with a knit cardigan with fur collar in the same floral motif. A crystal encrusted butterfly belt is then paired over leopard print pants and well, it's like the simple life has gotten a reboot. Personally, I wouldn't wear any of this, but I would be a dummy to not note that Y2K fashion has been bubbling up to the surface on social media. A similar style appears with a pink floral lace piped crop top and a cable knit fur colored cardigan, which is paired with. A pink butterfly belt and blue floral printed pants also make their way onto the model. Throughout this collection, you will see that more and more the looks are duplicated in different colors, which is a smart move for Blue Marine. It cuts down on sample production costs, and it constantly sears these styles into the audience's head. Floral printed sets are piped in faux furs, and the crop nature of the tops and high slits of the skirts definitely reflect that early 2000s vibe. While styles like these might definitely be 
trendy, seeing as how Y2K is back, it might be a smart way for Blue Marine to get back onto the lips of every stylist, editor, and critic, let alone every single customer. Sheer knit jackets are also piped in fur with those same belts being placed over top and flare printed bell bottoms play off the fur piping. A sheer cocktail dress is full of embellishments and lace details, while a butterfly choker and butterfly belt and bedazzled Roman sandal heels all heighten the aesthetic. A brown denim jacket with white fur piping does feel very Y2K, but twisted the usual blue denim and brown fur into a different direction. It's paired with a pink low slung skirt and crystal belt, which has the sparkle and pizzazz of the early 2000s. Another sheer dress in a perky pink rolls down the runway like a famous starlet rolling out of the club. The bejeweled butterflies as a choker, belt, and pasties definitely has references to the popular butterfly clips of the 90s, which Paris Hilton carried on famously during the early 2000s. To be honest, the look is a mess, but a hot mess, and well, the hotness I guess saves it. The floral printed silk halter dress with pink fur collar is brilliant. Will it stand the test of time and be a constant piece in a customer's wardrobe? I don't think so, but at this point, this collection is all about Y2K goodness, and this is that, most definitely. Sheer button downs that wrap around the waist are on display, and paired with butterfly crystal belts. Brognano's utilization of the butterfly again and again might make the style more associated with Blue Marine, for those that didn't live through the era, or at least don't remember the fashion that engulfed it. The 2D rose-trimmed miniskirt is a reference back to Blue Marine's association with the flower, which dates back quite some time to Anna Molinari, the brand's founder. Molinari is known for having many tattoos, one of her first being a rose, so Brognano keeping that motif alive is a nice nod to the brand's history. A blue sheer top is full of crystal embroidery that resembles a flower, which has a glitzy feel, while brown wash denim is paired with a crystal belt that oozes Y2K vibes with a metal rose buckle. It's also important to note that the satin pageboy caps that Brognano has given new life. Pageboy hats during the early 2000s were popular and were taken from the Irish flat cap created in a fun and funky fabric during that era, essentially taking the piss out of that almost 600 year old hat. Brognano then flips the script on the ruched dress, made most popular during the 1980s, and gives it a ruffled plunge and a neckline as well as a cutaway skirt. In pink and blue, the dress actually captures that floaty feeling of the 2000s and yet has a real elegance about it. Trying to recreate 20-year-old styles can sometime err on the side of costumey or even recreating period dress. I feel like Mina Lee and modern girls are going to kill me for calling Y2K period dress, but listen, I had to do it. But I do think that Brognano does a good job here of making the pieces close to the source material, but daring enough to feel modern. He might be ahead of the curve on the runway by a few seasons, but I think we'll see other designers pick up the era as inspiration soon enough. A blue faux fur coat has large collars and reminds me of some of Little Kim's late 90s fur escapades. Fashion-wise, Kim and her stylist Misa Hilton changed the game and ushered in a new era of the fashion industry taking inspiration from the streets and black culture. And for those a bit less daring, this blue strapless dress with ruffles still captures the energy of the times. You can't not talk about this drop waist dress with floral prints. It has the feeling of the 2000s with the silhouette of the 1920s and it's brilliant. I stupidly call the 2020s the Roaring 20s Part 2 the remix, but Brognano sort of adapted Gen Z's love of Y2K and referenced the era of swing music perfectly. The crystal necklace to waist belt is also very daring but fun at the same time and I can see it on quite a few editorials already. A yellow knit jacket cardigan and skirt arrive and might be a bit of a more commercially viable style and could appease older customers too. The blue fur collar piping and cuffs though keep the Y2K vibes right at the front. I mean, if this barely there silver string thread dress does not appear on a red carpet soon, I will scream. It's ridiculous, it's audacious, and it's valiant. The pink faux fur stole wrapped asymmetrically around the top gives it an even more fabulous feeling and like I am now needing to do like a heavy deep dive on the Y2K experience extravaganza fashion aesthetic. A crop top and pant style of this sheer thread dress we just saw emerged. The crop tops don't seem to be transparent, but the pants are, which makes them even more daring and the pieces being paired with the knit fur trimmed cardigans just makes me laugh. Brognano developed his own intarsian knits this season that have a metallic lacquer, which makes this sweater look 
and feel metallic. The keyhole cutouts with lace detailing definitely plays on the trends of shrugs, but the reflective nature of the knit plus the lace makes it all blue marine. It's truly a brilliant piece and that is undeniable. The faux fur skirt is a smart play into the textile that is throughout this collection, while a silky belt with a crystallized bee cements blue marine being back. A military green slip dress is piped in pink lace and is paired with a fur piped cardigan. The strappy sandals seem like they will get customers' hearts racing and will be perfectly primed for those looking to go out and dress up when it's safe again. A black off-the-shoulder crop top is piped in pink fur and it makes it so much funnier, and then is paired with a low-slung pair of pants. For the women not looking to buy their retro Y2K pieces from Sheen or Romway, Blue Marine has got them covered. The butterfly clips that Paris Hilton wore inspired Brognano even more as he debuts a knit purple dress that creates a butterfly motif on the bust. Brognano knows that the rose is the signature of Blue Marine, but he hopes his butterfly can signify a metamorphosis for the brand. I must say the subtle fabric vine that creeps up one of the model's sleeves is really lovely and a detail that honestly I hope we see more of. Another knit set arrives, this time a cardigan with hot pants, and it's in a full red fabric flower explosion, which in theory is nice, but in actuality seems a little bit strange. The sweater works and could be deemed wearable by some, but the protruding flowers from the shorts isn't attractive. A crop top and hot pant knit set adapts the butterfly dress we saw earlier and is cute. The threaded foliage and butterfly was a cuter detail on the sleeve though, and I'm gonna miss it being there. A sheer slip dress has fabric roses all throughout it, which pays homage to the brand's history. I'm not sure if it's gonna sell, maybe without the roses, but I'd like to see Brognano innovate on the rose more in future collections. The finale dresses are black and red gowns that are fully sheer and covered in the meandering roses. Again, I think they're fine and definitely could be nice for customers, but would have loved a really explosive Y2K finale dress to top off the collection. Overall, Brognano's Blue Marine had a blowout this season. It most definitely put the brand back on the map, which seemed to be his goal, and he most certainly has me excited to see what next season holds. Next, let's get into Valentino. Pier Paolo Pacioli's Valentino Ready to Wear is always far more demure than his haute couture collections. For the longest time, I wanted the same drama and spectacle for the Ready to Wear as the haute couture, but I think at this point, understanding that the Ready to Wear is a more commercial aspect of the brand, filled with the great attention to detail we expect from the brand. And you know what? That's okay. Okay. The collection started with a black caped wool jacket that covered a cutout sweater, white button down, and cutout turtleneck with a black skirt. It's a lot of layers, but considering it's fall, it makes sense. I wouldn't say it was the most exciting way to start off the collection though. A simple black cocktail dress has a perforated white collar and bib that feels doily-esque, and I could see this selling to a more conservative customer. The pattern of layers and sweaters and button downs continues, but the Harlequin print coat in black and white is definitely a callback to Valentino Garavani, the house's founder. Garavani liked utilizing black and white and utilizing lines to create shape, and there are most definitely sort of diamond styles all throughout his collections from the 70s and the 80s. A black and white plaid cape jacket, which is definitely something I can see the young women of Constance Billiards running around in on Gossip Girl, covers the rest of the look, but I do think this collection is a real extension of the olive branch to the everyday customer. Valentino, like just about every other brand, is trying to make every aspect of itself profitable. Considering things like tourism, which helps pump up most brands' profits, is shot. So if this coat sells, I'm all for it. Now, a sweater dress in black without cutout diamond details was eerily similar to the young British designer Stefan Cook. While I'm sure Cook didn't exactly invent cutout sweaters, it definitely feels reminiscent of his collections, which is a big no-no for big brands like Valentino. As we said during our Fendi review, big brands knocking each other off is par for the course, but knocking off small independent labels just feels like a David and Goliath battle, but with Goliath winning. A black and white polka dot dress with a bit of a flouncy skirt has the same lacy bib detail that we saw earlier. Cutout sweaters are found throughout this collection, but this floral motif was a rough one. Florals are signature to Valentino, but here it feels awkward, and while I can appreciate what Pier Paolo was going for, I can't see customers jumping for it. A black wool coat is lovely, and I can tell you if you have the chance to wear a Valentino coat, you'd better take it. We see the same layering as earlier, but with a Stefan Cook-esque sweater underneath 
again. A black coat is full of waves that join together, which feels reminiscent of couture techniques we saw during the spring 2021 couture collection. It's a nice coat, and for customers not able to afford couture, this might be a more doable option. A black sheer pussy bow blouse with lace panels is paired with a simple black skirt while a sheer gown with black lace and ruffles follows. I'd be interested to see if styles like this actually sell as I can't imagine most Valentino clients opting for showing off in that way. A blazer and short set is paired with a ruffled bib skirt, which brings a bit of a 70s glamour to the collection, which was a period where Valentino Garavani thrived. I'm interested to see if the 70s feeling gets customers' juices flowing though. Pierpaolo likes cutouts, and the diamond motifs continue and create a dress which would be a challenge to layer, but it's interesting to see the sort of slit style going on. A white cape was placed over a skirt and ruffled bib top. The cape is full of lines created by fabric cutouts that look as if they've been braided onto the cape. I'm unsure of the process of how this cape style was made, but I can be sure that it probably took hours upon hours to figure out, and then even more hours upon hours to actually make. The beauty of Valentino Ready to Wear is that it tries its darndest to emulate the haute couture. A white boucle cape with deep plunge is actually reminiscent again of the haute couture collection, which makes some historical sense. In reality, Valentino started as an haute couture house, so the ready to wear delineating inspiration from the couture is understandable. A white wave turtleneck underneath adds a bit of interest to the otherwise commercial style. I also can't help but notice the leather pedal boots here, which have been adapted from early Valentino handbags by Pierpaolo. No, they're not Pierpaolo's bags, Pierpaolo adapted them. Yeah, you're getting what I'm saying. Pierpaolo gave us a couple of metallic styles during his spring 2021 haute couture collection, and so a gold cable knit sweater and matching skirt is very much so welcome. This is the way to adapt the couture sensibilities into ready to wear that would make customers feel as if they are wearing couture. A reflective gold rose edition handbag is a perfect way to incorporate Pierpaolo's aesthetics into the handbags too, which is a major sector for most luxury brands. A cream ruffle dress is sad. It's just not good. That's it, that's the tweet. More polka dots arrive, this time not as prints, but rather threads clustered together to create small balls sewn on top of netting. The couture sensibilities in the ready to wear rears its beautiful little face once again. The 3D polka dots were placed on a button down shirt and three ribbons were placed in a row down the center of the shirt. Editing is important sometimes. This is definitely one of those times. A layered look is covered by a black and white graphic cape, one which holds a very special place in the history of the House of Valentino. The V logo has been worn by the likes of Jackie Kennedy, one of Mr. Garavani's earliest muses. Pierpaolo has recreated the V logo into his own style, but nodding back to this style with a more vintage graphic twist is sweet. Speaking on Mrs. Kennedy though, it's important to note that the all black and white collection might actually have another tie into her. When Valentino showed his collection in 1964 in New York's Waldorf Astoria, Jackie bought six haute couture dresses in black and white. So maybe Pierpaolo was tapping into this little tidbit throughout the collection? Now, the plastic fringe jacket that follows is less understandable. If you're gonna go for a plastic fringe, you have to really go for it, like Miss Prada. You cannot try to downplay it like this black jacket. It has to be ridiculous. It has to be over the top, almost zany. Why not plastic flowers that create a bouquet on the jacket or the signature Valentino Rosso? But a boring jacket like this, it looks disheartening, not innovative. A braided sweater can be seen underneath a black wool coat with floral appliques. Florals, again, they're a signature of the brand, so it makes sense, but I'd like to see if customers hop onto it. Although that sweater underneath, beautiful. A fully sheer white lace dress obviously poses the question of who would buy it? But when the dress radiates such a beautiful aura, I don't really care who would buy it. The netting that starts up at the top and then falls into the embroidered flowers at this bust area that almost look as if they could double as tattoos is honestly stunning. I couldn't help but notice the pockets, which I think are very, very funny. It's just a lovely gown and I hope Valentino customers are brave enough to don it. A large black cape falls to a shin length and it definitely would be a smart investment for customers. A black plastic fringe sweater vest, on the other hand, doesn't seem as wise. A black skirt suit melds youthful lengths with a professional sensibility. The jacket's cut is sharp and robust, but without being uninteresting. 
I mean, that collar is big but daring at the same time. The bubbly little skirt paired with it makes it even more fun and deviates from the linear feel of the jacket without seeming like a separate piece. This is a way to meld two different customer bases together. A white braided sweater again infuses the couture techniques we love from Valentino. The sweater is covered in thin feathers, which we have seen on many a Valentino couture runway, and I'm sure customers who can't afford couture would love to have one at a lesser price in their wardrobe for just kicking around in. You know, going to the grocery store, picking up the kids from soccer. Normally, a dress like this full of glittery embroidery on a sheer net fabric would disturb me. It can easily run into Xenon Prince this warrior has been, but here the purple hues of the metal pieces sort of draw me in. The use of the metallic pieces does allow these lines to come in, which are another Valentino signature, and they become fully realized, which is actually very nice. A black cocktail dress is disappointing. I could see the dress selling, but the ribbons and the cut of the skirt with the seam visible, it's just, ugh. The wave motifs make their way back in a fully sheer gown with a fringe of lace falling out. And I have to say, it's cute, it's daring, it's a little bit over the top, I kinda love it. The sequins cape, eh, a bit tacky. But the lace wave turtleneck might be a good move for customers not brave enough to buy the full gown version. A black lattice gown is sheer and has the floral appliques we saw earlier on in the collection. Here it actually works a bit better as it's not cut off by an opaque sweater and it being allowed to be fully itself makes it a lot more believable and a lot more, I don't know, hot. A black sheer dress is covered in feathers and again, a nice way to get a couture-like style for a more affordable price. Affordable price, maybe not the best way to talk about ready to wear, it's probably like a $5,000 dress, but you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying. This Roman style dress here is actually quite sweet. It flows, the way the edges are frayed gives it a tiny nod to the radical notions Pier Paolo is going for this season, and the way it exposes the arms and ties together at the shoulders is also really nice. The fishnet turtleneck just adds that little bit of interest that only further pushes the look into one of the best of this collection. It's hot, it's really hot. I do wish the previous look had been the finale dress as the black sheer and lace dress we're getting. Here, it's a bit blah in comparison. Overall, this ready to wear collection from Valentino was a bit meh. I mean, at least when compared to the Haute Couture collection we saw in January, but like again, everything you compare to the Haute Couture collection is gonna be a bit blah. But I must say, there was a lot of wearable pieces. There were a lot of adaptations of the Couture collections for a wider audience, and nice nods to the brand's history too. I also think I need to stop expecting fantasy and drama from a Valentino ready to wear collection, cause it shouldn't be required. Again, like that's why we have Haute Couture. The final collection we're gonna be discussing for this Milan Fashion Week review is Versace. Now, Versace this season was a dud. And I'm sad to have to say it, because honestly, I finally got my head around Versace just rehashing Gianni's collections, but this mess was just too much. The brand launched a new monogram, which is confusing. The Medusa head, which the brand is known for, might have fizzled out in the past couple of years, maybe after Migos' Versace song lost popularity, but this seems like the perfect time to reinstitute the Barococo silk print dominance, a Versace classic that was dear to Gianni's heart. Instead, Versace tried to fall in line with the likes of Vuitton, Dior, Gucci, Celine, Goyard, and so many more in order to create a monogram, but it's depressing and does not at all represent the tacky, innovative, revolutionary work of the Versace label at all, which feels like a miss. So the collection opened with a cutout dress covered by a blazer cut jacket and paired with a singular red and blue glove and bag, which was the way for the new monogram to be debuted. The black clothing seemed to be a backdrop for the colorful bag and gloves, but did it really do anything to help the bag cement itself? Not in my mind. A black wool crepe jacket is layered over a turtleneck and skirt as well as a pair of pants. In my mind, it's referential of Versace's Fall 1991 collection, which becomes more and more apparent as the collection goes on. But these styles do not hold a candle in the wind to the original Fall 1991 looks. If you'd like to see a little bit more of a breakdown of that iconic Versace collection, we have a video on it. Go watch, it's very good. I put a lot of work into it. A fitted crop top has an interesting collar, which feels reminiscent of the cut 
of Versace dresses from fall 1991, although it's definitely not a copy. I could see how those styles definitely influence this collection though. A matching skirt has a little dip in the center of the waist and the pleated opening does seem like a possible reference to the pleated skirts throughout that collection as well. A black dress with interesting cup cut is again most definitely a reference to all the iconic dresses from the fall 1991 collection. When you think about how this would be the 30 year anniversary of this collection, it gets even less difficult to tie the two together. Although referencing is great, Versace here needs to innovate on those references or at least match their energy, otherwise it's just underwhelming rehashes. A crop top and skirt with fall 1991 leanings were placed underneath a brown wool coat that is definitely lined with patent leather and the new Versace monogram. I understand Versace is trying to be more commercially minded, but these just don't even feel like the brand. And I personally don't know if customers would be drawn to styles like these in that case. A full monogram style arrives in mostly browns. A blown up monogram coat allows the motif to be seen up close, but with the likes of the Versace name and certain lines, it makes me queasy. A monogram is supposed to be so distinct it can be told apart from other brands. If you have to spell out your brand's name, doesn't that defeat the purpose? The cropped vest and button down shirt underneath are just there, but the striped pants are kind of cute. A similar look follows without the coat, but still it doesn't give much of interest. Not only are these colors bland, this monogram does not have any cultural cachet the way a Dior, a Fendi, or a Louis Vuitton monogram does. I'm not saying that it can't build the cachet, but but right now it doesn't have it. That would be a business issue in my mind because well, you'll be sitting on a bunch of product that doesn't mean anything to just about everybody, no? More monogram prints are thrown on top of each other and the orange leather piping on that skirt now reminds me of Burberry's new TB monogram. I will say that these styles definitely have a 70s graphic vibe to them and when you add these headscarves, it adds in that Nona in a small village aesthetic too. And even more so, those chunky loafers definitely reinforce everything that we just discussed. To be honest, I'm just confused by this and it makes me crave a new designer that could actually reinterpret the Versace feeling. <coughs> Laquan Smith. <coughs> Sorry. Me. Now, the green monogram is a bit better. At least it doesn't feel as boring as all of the browns. But I do think the motorcycle jacket is a nice ode to Gianni's work. Gianni was obsessed with the rock and roll era of the 1950s, and you could see that throughout his work, looking at his fall 1991 collection specifically. I should shut up about fall 1991, but that's the reference point for this whole collection, it seems. The motorcycle jackets with crystal encrustments from that fall 1991 collection is a very good example of this. A monogram jacket in green is reflective, which is sweet, but again, not revolutionary. I am extremely happy to see Precious Lee on the runway as most designers were dressing full figure models, but since COVID that number has most definitely shrunk. Here a turtleneck is paired with a pleated skirt and a multi monogram jacket. It's just a real mess compared to Precious's look from last season. I mean, I will never shut up about that dress. It was awe inspiring and when I see Precious here, I'm just truly let down. It's not her. It's not her at all. A monogram dress puts together a best of Gianni Versace Fall 1991 moment collage together. I mean, if you look at the cut of the bra and then you look at the chainmail skirt, it's, it's yeah, it's very Versace. Gianni Versace did invent a fabric dubbed Oraton, which is a chainmail and can take on patterns like the skirt. I won't say I'm obsessed with it, but I do like the nod to historic Versace textiles. The fur coat with the green monogram though has the same issues we mentioned earlier. A blue monogram motif arrives in a windbreaker style and it's tucked into a leather skirt and has blue monogram tights underneath. I think this might be a reference back to Versace's 1980s roots, but even with a bit of Versace historical background, I'm confused. A blue monogram turtleneck is paired under a red monogram and black dress. It's not good. The dress is strange and the styling is even weirder, but luckily this look did help me understand what the point of the monogram is. Essentially, when you look at the Medusa logo image, the Medusa face is surrounded by a border with meander or Greek key border patterns. I believe these patterns have been subverted to create a new monogram. In reality, the Medusa comes from Gianni saying he and other kids would play in the abandoned Greco-Roman ruins in his hometown of Reggio Calabria. He would see the Medusa Medusa head on the floor of these ruins and then went on to interpret it later on in his career in this fashion. So I personally think that that is where this monogram finds inspiration, but even with that in 
info, it's still quite indiscernible. And honestly, it like took me a few days to really register that, which is a problem. A black suit is adorned with a blue monogram detail, but doesn't seem like a natural way to incorporate the pattern into the suit. I also don't know if customers would clamor to have their suit adorned with a monogram they don't know much about. I know the biggest reference back to the fall 1991 Versace collections comes in a trio of looks that the Twitter account Hood by Kenny pointed out. Shout out Hood by Kenny. The looks were initially made of wool, had full skirts, and had the models remove their jackets on the runway like it was a fashion show. But the fall 2021 collection didn't have any of the original appeal, and each of the dresses' styles just feel flat when compared to the bodaciousness of the original looks. Like, I literally mean they feel flat. It's just... Huh, if you're gonna reference these things, at least match the same energy. I, I'm not expecting any more for it to be better than the original, but like at least put it on the same level. You know what I mean? Another red and blue monogram dress arrives. And again, it's just, it's blah. And with the belt, please. A silky version of the red monogram arrives in a jacket and skirt. And while it's nice to see the monogram in a different fabric, it doesn't do much to convince me of its status. A red and yellow monogram mismatch set arrives and is in Oroton, which is again nice, but nothing crazy. Versace will, from this collection, have to constantly update the monogram and shove it in the face of customers. That's just how monograms work. You also have to like build a status for it. Otherwise, again, it just doesn't mean anything to anybody. I think working with artists to manipulate the monogram in the way Marc Jacobs did at Vuitton might be helpful, but only after the monogram itself is established. You have to probably do this for like, I don't know, five or 10 years before we really like, oh, that's a Versace monogram. But then after that, you have to keep on updating it. And so it's, this is gonna be a process in my opinion. A patent leather coat is piped in the red monogram. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the patent leather is a reference to the boots from the fall 1991 Versace show. Oraton monogram dresses arrive, but don't do much convincing of their sex appeal, nor flattery of the body. But a gold Oraton dress is sweet, and I could easily see it being a hit with customers. Like, I would probably buy something along those lines. A black dress with curved neckline definitely is reminiscent of the black dresses towards the end of the fall 1991 show, but again, here doesn't do much to innovate on those styles, leaving this dress a bit blah. A black body Goddess has a glittery belt from which a sheer panel falls to make it a gown and sheer sleeves give it a bit more maturity without making it feel dowdy. But again, it's just not exciting. And at a Versace show, I want to be leaving feeling excited. I deserve to be leaving feeling excited. A similar dress in a baby doll style would actually be quite sweet if it wasn't for the monogram and glittery embroidery crisscrossing at the bust. It just kills what would have otherwise been a sweet and pretty commercial dress. The finale gown made up of the monogram in a sheer fabric embroidered crisscross bust and sheer skirt is the true definer of this collection. Snoozy. This is the best we could come up with to finish off the collection. Although I have to give credit where credit is due throughout this whole collection, those shoes are hot. Like they're sexy, they're steamy, they're good. I kind of hope that they sell well. I have to say, after last season's Versace show, I was feeling reinvigorated about the brand. But this season's difficult to navigate monogram launch and less than interesting references back to an iconic Gianni Versace collection might have put me off the brand again. But I'm just, I'm praying. I, I don't even pray. I'm praying El nome de Padre de Filio de Spiritu Santo that it's, you know, something about this Versace collection in the future is better. Hopefully, I don't, I just, it's sad. But that is the end of our video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Tell me your favorite collection, your least favorite collection, some things you found interesting, some things you didn't. I'd love to hear all about it. And I will see you guys for our Paris Fashion Week review video. I don't want to put a date on it because you know that it's going to take a while. So I'll see you guys later and TTYL.